Today to be joined by a high-level panel of experts, including Abhilash Nair, who is a senior lecturer at Northumberland University in the United Kingdom, Hussein Badram, who is the chief technology officer for the region of MENA for Cisco Systems International, uh, Wolf Ludwig, who is the uh, co-founder of the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, Camino Majon Sierra, who is International Relations Policy Officer at DG Connect at the European Commission, Pr uh, Pranesh Prakesh, who is Policy Director for the Centre of Internet and Society in India, and Andrew Pudafat, who is, uh, who is the Director of Global Partners and Associates. Um, I'd like to point out that Index. I'd like to point out that Index on Censorship has put together a policy paper outlining some of the key issues in this debate uh, and issues relating to the IGF. There are copies over there, just on the side. It's entitled "Standing Up to Threats to Digital Freedom: Can We Keep the Internet Free?" and it looks at some of our examples as a free speech NGO working uh, across the globe. This session is focused on two key areas, which is the takedown, blocking and filtering of content and the export of surveillance technology and its impact on privacy. The panel will explore the ways in which these areas can affect free speech online and also how civil society governments and corporations can and should approach these issues. We want to distinguish the censorship that private companies are required to do by states and its impact, but also the voluntary censorship that corporations right now are taking it upon themselves to do. Um, there's a list of questions we're hoping to answer, which is in the, uh, which is on the IGF website. But r broadly speaking, we want to look at uh, is, in is censorship and surveillance more pervasive uh, and intrusive online than offline? How filters and firewalls are impacting on free speech? how takedown requests are impacting on public debate and the public interest, how blanket surveillance and data gathering is affecting freedom of expression, which is extremely pertinent in light of comments made about the UK's draft communications data bill made this morning. And we'll also look at how regulations and laws, including intermediary responsibility, are impacting on digital free expression. We've got some opening comments uh, from our speakers, then I'd very much like to bring in uh, the assembled audience here quickly into the debate and also take um, some tweets which are on hashtag IGF12 and at index censorship. So first to speak is uh, Abhilash. Thank you and good afternoon to all. Um, <coughs> censorship is um, uh, an issue which is probably as old as the internet itself in relation to the internet. Um, in fact, there have been arguments, a number of arguments, uh, which point to the fact that censorship stands against what the Internet stands for. Um, and that argument has been advanced by various civil liberty uh, activists uh, dating back to 1990s in the US uh, when they first tried to censor uh, pornography to protect children uh, through legislation in 1996 which was unsuccessful uh, because the Supreme Court found it unconstitutional and a subsequent effort at another legislation in 2008 uh, with the Child Online uh, Protection Act, which was also struck down after a, a long and protracted litigation as unconstitutional. Now, there is a slight difference from uh, about 15 years ago when censorship or the talks about censorship surrounded on state level initiatives, i.e. legislation, what was, was the uh, ultimate means of enforcing censorship. Now, the internet and the way the internet functions has in some ways necessitated a change uh, which has resulted in a shift in focus from state-level legislation, regulation, to uh, induce a uh, uh, sort of focused legislation where uh, in, uh, ultimately and eventually uh, intermediaries such as ISPs uh, will have to take a, a more active role. And the UK can uh, offer a, a fantastic example for that, the way in which child pornography has been tackled. Um, the ISPs have an obligation now once they have constructive notice of um, existence of illegal content on their uh, network, then they have an obligation to take it off. Now, 
because the, um, the, the, the overall uh, objective here was the protection of children, uh, there was some degree of universal consensus, nobody objected to it, and nobody really talked about the uh, implications on free speech. Uh, but that changed, uh, because that approach of going after the end user um, or uh, imposing obligations on uh, ISPs was further extended to uh, certain other types of uh, pornographic content, um, such as extreme pornography, uh, which does not involve any children, it's actually adults. And so it raised further questions, why should the state interfere with uh, the choices that uh, grown-up adults make out of their own, their own sweet will? Um, ISPs and uh, other private actors also have a role uh, with extreme pornography as well in, in the United Kingdom. Um, now, that raises, as I said, uh, freedom of expression, free speech issues uh, with respect to, uh, to what level can the state require uh, ISPs um, or private actors to enforce uh, censorship. You can find that debate in other areas like copyright as well, with the Digital Economy Act passed in 2010 in the UK uh, that uh, the ISPs now have further obligations uh, to, to monitor uh, content. Uh, that is a, a big change from what it was about uh, 10 years ago. Um, ISPs were widely regarded as uh, mere conduits. They didn't have any active obligation to uh, monitor content, but now they're having to assume more and more editorial uh, role in some way or the other. Now, the implication for speech um, with respect to private actors uh, uh, having to do censorship is, uh, uh, is, is manifold. Uh, at a starting, uh, as a starting point, um, it would be highly in a practical world because of the cost uh, associated with uh, monitoring and taking down content. It's highly likely that ISPs would be tempted to take down content without actually investigating the merits of a complaint of each uh, of each case in order to avoid liability. Uh, that's one issue. There is also an issue from the end user point of view that how is the poor end user uh, supposed to know whether a content is, in, for example, for copyright, if it's copyrighted or not, or if it's um, what is at the moment vaguely defined as illegal extreme pornography, if it's uh, illegal or not. So there are a, a, a range of um, a constitutional, range of free speech, um, human rights issues surrounding private uh, censorship. Um, I'll stop there. But I'll be happy to take uh, any, any questions after everybody has spoken. Thank you very much. Um, the next person to speak is uh, Dr. Hussein Madan. Thank, uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure really to be invited to this uh, distinguished panel. And I thank all uh, participants for taking the time um, to show their interest uh, by being here. Uh, I think the topic is uh, certainly um, very important and uh, is getting even more relevant and more important given the circumstances, given the occasions that ha are happening globally not to mention the Middle East um, uh, region, uh, which relate directly to issues of censorship and, uh, and monitoring of, of content on the internet. Um, um, I would like to say that um, beside being working, working, working for Cisco as the Chief Technology Officer of the Middle East and Africa, I'm also on the board of um, ISOC uh, Egypt, which is the ISOC chapter in Egypt. Um, and um, perhaps most of my comments will relate to that, that capacity more than, than a vendor, vendor specific. Um, uh, as, as you know, Egypt has seen uh, dramatic um, events happening during the evolution of January 25th, uh, 2011. We have seen the government taking action by gradually cutting down um, communication services, including first um, social media and then mobile, uh, and then fully the internet um, access to um, um, citizens uh, across the country which is really a drastic action that uh, was thought to be the uh, way to stop the revolution, which of course unsuccessful. But, but this has triggered um, uh, um, um, actions from different parts of society. And um, the, the um, reason for or the justification for cutting telecommunication services lied in the one definition in the telecom law uh, that allowed um, government to intervene in case of a, of a major, major um, disaster or major um, event that, that can damage what, what is mentioned public security or national security. So that was really the justification. So based on that, there was a, um, a public outcry to modify the, the telecom law, and that is currently under, uh, uh, under process. Um, there were some public hearing writing um, some uh, articles in the law, including this one in particular, but due to the issue of parliament being changed, so it has not been ratified yet. yet. But that was the, the trigger for this discussion. 
Um, um, we see also the engagement uh, of civil society um, trying to raise awareness of, of, of community. We see that people are not really aware of um, if they have any rights to the content on, on, on the internet, if they see uh, content being harmful or content being taken down without justification, who should they talk to? What, what power does their opinion have? And this is a, a lack of, uh, of perspective or lack of awareness part of um, uh, regarding communities at large in the, in the Middle East that their opinion really, really counts and what vehicles they should use to make their opinion heard. And we can, we can see a, um, a clear example on this with the video that was propagated on the internet uh, uh, a month and a half ago that we find, many of us find offensive regarding Prophet Muhammad. Um, so the outcry was seen in terms of demonstrations, but if there is another way people can raise their voice and have the, their, their interest being, be, being flagged and taken into consideration, I think this is very, very appropriate to raise such concerns uh, for people who run social media and, and, such, and run over the top operators. Um, uh, we see also issues regarding to, to, to privacy being being brought into uh, into uh, in, into the front, um, privacy of um, personal information, privacy of private content that's not intended to be shared, but is shared through uh, illegal means, through phishing, through um, uh, malware and, and viruses. So these, these kind of actions are ga gaining some some attention. But in, in large, we see still in the Middle East, compared to the developing uh, developed world, engagement of civil society is quite lagging behind. It's not there yet where it's supposed to be and that's that's an issue government is taking the lead but as you know government have lots on their mind and perhaps communication is not the top, top priority privacy in communication is not top priority so we see a role uh, to by the uh, by the civil society to play um, and that requires some some attention and some perhaps engagement with with um, with other civil societies globally to see best practices and how we can get about uh, addressing problems that have been have been seen in other parts of the world um, engagement with, with writing laws I mentioned, uh, particularly on the, the privacy side, but also with the constitution. We have opportunity in Egypt now to write, write we're writing a new constitution, and um, um, there there's a, um, we, civil societies and others made the point that privacy should be, uh, of information should be protected in the constitution, and um, it, that was accepted, expanded to, um, to digital information was known, known, known to be on telephony, on telephone conversation or telex in the, in the previous days, now has been extended or will be extended, we hope, to also so information uh, on, online to pro uh, privacy of that information should be protected in the constitution, hence laws should be written to, to accommodate this, uh, this, this uh, constitutional right. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to thank speak on much. this uh, panel. Uh, In my opinion, the problem is uh, older than the online age, the pri uh, privatization of censorship, uh, uh, due to my observation as a journalist, has started before. Uh, there was a kind of a structural uh, censor, uh, censorship uh, by media concentration uh, over the last uh, 30 years and uh, the media concentration uh, and the, uh, corporate and, uh, journalism uh, undermined corporate the diversity journalism. of media reporting uh, what we had uh, 30, 40 years ago. So there is already a, a, a kind of a starting point before the, the, on, uh, the digital age and um, over the last couple of years we could observe all sorts of reasons and so-called best intentions what may have an impact on freedom of expression. It started with the whole security debate. Security is always one of the best reasons to undermine uh, basic civil rights or whatsoever. Uh, child porn is another context where by best intentions government suddenly started uh, to talk about how can we control or block content on the internet. Another issue is uh, existing copy copyright regulation. 
their right holders and the right holders industry are at the moment very at the forefront to think about all kind of control mechanisms to protect authors' rights, as they always argue. What I think, uh, in my opinion, as a journalist, it's one of the most hypocritical debates I've seen over the last couple of years. I think uh, there is an uh, importance to distinguish clearly between authors who do, in many cases, have no rights about their works any longer. So it's, a, it's an initiative by the right holders industry and the right holders industry on, on a broader level is trying its, be, uh, its best to control content and this may impact freedom of expression as well or imply some sort of censorship. In any cases, in my opinion, the principle of open access uh, is at stake and we have to be very careful over the next couple of years and we have to be very vigilant by creating awareness in civil society to fight against those tendencies. At the end of my uh, uh, intervention, uh, let me just mention a good example, a best practice, I, uh, I think, uh, let me uh, take the uh, case uh, from a Reporter Without uh, Borders, Germany. They, some weeks ago, uh, published a, a press release and a, sh a short paper on surveillance technology. making the point on what surve surveillance technology may mean, uh, may affect, etc. And uh, they try to create a debate on how can we control the export trade of surveillance uh, technology. And I don't want to go into further details. If anybody is interested, uh, he or she can ask me afterwards. But I think it's basically an excellent idea to think about having a similar type of trade regulation as we have for conventional arms. Because surveillance technology is in the wrong hands, has disastrous effects, and as we by existing exactly. rules and laws and regulation and do already control conventional arms. I think we should think in the same direction with surveillance technology. This is, can, uh, in my opinion, is a starting point of a discussion. I think uh, it might be uh, controversial, but um, let's start with it. It's a, it's, a, it's a very excellent segue because um, uh, the European Parliament has, ju has just voted on a motion uh, calling for uh, export controls on surveillance technologies, which leads us to our next speaker, um, Nina. Hello. Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Mike, and Industrial Censorship for giving us the opportunity Hello. today to be well, present in your Thank workshop. You very much, Mike, um, I work for the European for Commission, and my role today is basically to introduce um, the solutions, or what we think is the solution to the several programs that have been proposed today. Especially, I will tackle as well the one related to uh, dual use and as well uh, of Syri exports that we've enforced against Syria and against Iran. Um, I think that already in 2010, when the, this, start, this conversation started to be perhaps more heightened, freedom of expression was already a big priority for the European Commission in terms of policies. But I wouldn't deny that the Arab Spring acted as an extreme wake-up call to all of us, not just uh, in terms of the risk for freedom of expression, but also of the consequences of inaction on the side of public institutions, which are going to be held responsible in uh, ultimately of uh, a lack of freedom of expression of our citizens and of our um, internet use users. 
um, I would like first to address what we've done in the area of corporate social responsibility. We think we are a um, big supporter of self-regulation, although I agree with you that in several cases, like in the case of dual use, uh, self-regulation has not delivered the uh, results that should have been uh, delivered. Uh, however, we are trying to strengthen our conversations with private sector. That's what we've done through the entire year, organizing a couple of round tables, and uh, particular in how to apply the United Nations uh, RUGI framework for human rights and business to the particularities of the EU businesses, which you may understand that the Global Network Initiative could be perhaps is a very good framework, but could be not well adapted to the EU framework because basically our um, internal market is based on a strong mesh of MS SMEs, which may our, um, internal market is based on a strong mesh of SMEs, which may adopt a framework like GNI, which is mainly set for broader companies and telecom companies. So our orientation with this framework is to come up with uh, concrete guidelines on issues, particular issues that affect EU industry. Uh, we will do so by the beginning of 2013. We're a little bit delayed, three or four months. And the reason why is because we are publishing for the second time these guidelines, these draft guidelines for comments. I think it's a very good framework as well because it's an entirely multi-stakeholder. As you may know, there are many other frameworks. Uh, we have here today with us also Telia Sonera. They are part of one of them. Uh, I think it's good for us, and it's an intention of the Commission, to try to bring together around the table all these players so that we achieve critical mass and so that because uh, if we may run the risk of having several initiatives, corporate social responsibility initiatives coming from private sector, civil society, governments, so it would be good to streamline the same objectives in all of them. Uh, secondly, I would like to talk about the No Disconnect strategy because that's how the Commission, and in particular DG Connect, and our Commissioner is addressing uh, problems uh, regarding freedom of speech on the Internet. I must say that it has a strong foreign policy component. We're not addressing what happens in terms of censorship and surveillance within the EU, but then initially the starting point was the South Mediterranean, but I don't think that technology can be restricted to just one geographical uh, region. So uh, in the end, uh, this will spread through Europe, I guess, as well. Uh, the so, main uh, four strands of uh, the No Disconnect strategy are educate online journalists, uh, human rights offenders, and even inter end, end users, internet users, on the risks and on the threats that uh, the internet behavior can, can imply. We, we have two severe challenges. One of them is that these guys require a constant update. And second is because not all the authoritarian countries that are restricting internet access have the same, uh, the same technological uh, level of development and therefore it's not the same some guidelines uh, for country A that for country B. Let's put Iran, Iran is a highly technological environment. I understand that we have to strengthen our efforts in those cases. Uh, second, we have to strengthen our research portfolio in order to develop privacy, uh, uh, well, privacy enhancing technologies. Also, we're developing me mesh networks, which I think is also a good solution. And we are coming up with something called the um, European Situational Awareness Platform. Uh, that is intended to give us uh, almost real-time knowledge of what is happening on the ground in terms of internet censorship and surveillance. In the sense that we're aiming at connecting dots like um, failure at the internet at uh, security level or security events or shutdowns or problems with connections with what is happening on the ground in terms of restrictions to activists and uh, as a result have um, a better basis or an evidence-based policy making in order to act. And thirdly, as our colleague also mentioned, that cybersecurity is one of the Achilles heels of, uh, pr of internet freedom or of freedom of expression as such. Uh, you know that the European Commission is coming up with a new cybersecurity strategy in the coming months. Uh, our services are responsible of ensuring that there are human rights considerations uh, included in the strategy and in, in particular human rights impact assessment before any security laws are issued or security regulation. And we come to the most, uh, the most important part, which is uh, surveillance, uh, restriction of surveillance and censorship, restriction of trade. Uh, we are providing technical support to our colleagues of DigiTrade on well, what concerns the dual use regulation, and we welcome very much also these amendments from uh, Marie Chesciake. I would just like to highlight a certain word of caution, saying that perhaps this is not the only solution, and we tend to resort to it as if it was a uh, silver bullet. And there are several problems of including in that annex uh, certain technology. It's very difficult for, a, for an institution which has some checks and balances uh, to be able to update that list 
as technology evolves. So as a result, we may end up putting in that list uh, um, surveillance gear or censorship gear that is either outdated or that it causes negative consequences for human rights activists that as a result have no access to certain encryption products or certain software products that they do need also to protect themselves. And um, <coughs> uh, the main problem is that as far as we are not, uh, we're not addressing the demand and we still try to kill the supply, we're never going to get to a final, final good result. And that, I leave it at that because I guess that other speakers also have the role today. Thank you. Uh, we've got two more speakers and then we're going to move into uh, questions from the audience. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Pranesh. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thank you uh, to everyone else. Um, I'd like to first highlight a few very general principles about uh, how we contextualize censorship, especially when it comes to the internet. Then uh, a few points on free speech, a few points on surveillance. Uh, censorship generally can be of, uh, I, I believe, four types. One, uh, state censorship. This uh, can be legal and extra legal. So sometimes uh, the, gov uh, the police, for instance, can extra legally seize uh, books or ask for domain name blocks, as has happened in India when cartoonsagainstcorruption.com was asked to be blocked by uh, the Mumbai police. Uh, they wrote to the DNS hosting company asking them to, to remove it. But uh, they don't, under the law, have any such authority. It can also be state-aided private censorship, and this too can be legal or extra-legal. Uh, we've seen situations, uh, for instance, where copyright law has been used as a tool of, uh, of censorship. Uh, so right now, there's a case going on in, in the Indian courts to which uh, we are also a party now. Uh, which is against, uh, which has been filed by um, uh, one of India's largest record labels, T-Series, uh, against MySpace, uh, the almost dead News Corp corporation. In that case, the judge has held uh, very worryingly that uh, just because of the fact that there was copyright infringement that happened, despite MySpace showing that every time they got a request for removal, even before, you know, without having proper processes even, they actually removed just on the basis of complaint, not on the basis of proof, just on the basis of complaint. And MySpace having asked uh, the record label to come on board with their program of, uh, of saying, give us your songs and their fingerprints and we can eliminate those despite those offers being there and despite MySpace actually not having the technological ability to monitor each and every upload uh, onto their website for copyright infringement despite all of that uh, the, the judge held that MySpace is responsible so despite best efforts if even one instance of copyright infringement happens the host becomes liable under the interpretation of the law according to this one judge in the Delhi High Court. We're challenging that and I think if we have this principle then no intermediary that's a web host can exist. Uh, no web, you have to, you know, in, in essence uh, rent your own servers. There's no possibility of using, uh, you know, uh, someone else uh, as an intermediary to do so. Private censorship uh, is the third category, and this too can be uh, legal and extra legal. Uh, I'll focus more on the on the one instance of the extra legal. Uh, the ISP Reliance, uh, they're uh, they're one of uh, the world's largest ISPs. They uh, are amongst the owners of the flag network that goes around the entire globe, uh, the undersea cable that goes on, uh, through the entire globe, and. Uh, they're quite large in India too. Now, the hacker collective, or maybe it's the hacker uncollective, anonymous, uh, they hacked into Reliance's servers 
and got a list of all the websites that Reliance has blocked. Now, in this list, we saw stuff relating to specific, uh, that many links were there to, uh, which were about a specific Reliance employee, a very senior Reliance um, official who had been put in jail during uh, investigations of the uh, 2G scam uh, that's still ongoing in India. And these were, uh, and on and, and the day that was released, I checked on Reliance's networks and I couldn't access many of the websites, while in other networks, I could access those websites. The next day, uh, magically, I could access them again on Reliance's networks. Uh, they had unblocked it. But evidence continues to remain that they had tried to, uh, to block this because uh, some of these videos had been uploaded on YouTube and some on, on uh, other sites, including Vimeo. On YouTube, uh, you see that Reli one of Reliance's companies has actually filed uh, copyright takedown notices. And on YouTube, those videos remain unavailable. While on, Vi on Vimeo, those same videos, which are of all kinds of things, which, which uh, big entertainment, the Reliance company couldn't have copyright over, things like a dog trying to get out of, a, like a short home video of a dog trying to get out of a, of, a, uh, of a door, of some people in one room clapping, of all kinds of things, not from, not from films or any such, were sought to be blocked because they were, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, an attack in, in, uh, you know, in very subtle way on, on reliance and, and uh, corruption. This shows us that transparency is required. We need to know what is blocked, even if we can't access it. We need to know how we can remedy it uh, in case that what is blocked is felt by some to be wrongly blocked. Then the fourth is societal censorship, and this is usually extra legal. And this is what leads to self-censorship. Now, uh, if we have a situation where in the law, uh, the publication of a work uh, that creates enmity between communities is held to be legal, then what happens in those situations, as has we have see, we've seen in India uh, in the past, where one community goes, uh, beats up one professor who published a book, uh, his, uh, or in this case, who helped with the research for a book uh, on a on on a, a king on a, a medieval king in India, and uh, and they got enraged by it. What do you do in such situations? The court eventually, thankfully, held that you can't go on riot and use that as proof that the government should ban the book because the government in this case did ban the book, and the, thankfully the court overruled it. But this is a, a, a real issue, and this does lead to self-censorship in the future. One very important point that emerges through all of this, I think, is that issues of intermediary liability, etc., are very important. Uh, on the internet, uh, there is no there is no possibility of speaking freely, uh, really, the way that there is off the internet. And by this, what I mean is that. Uh, there are no public spaces online. Now, Frank LaRue, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression, I, uh, in, in his report last year, spoke about uh, La Plaza Publica, uh, which exists in Guatemala, the public squares, right? And the internet as embodying this. I respectfully disagree with him. I believe that uh, on the internet, uh, we live on shopping malls. They are public in some uh, ways, internet, but it's uh, all private. Malls. Okay, uh, public and and ways, the fact is, even if you own your own under current systems of the internet, even if you own your own.
on contracts. We've seen the rise of the consumer rights movement since the 1960s, contracts, right? So the there are limitations that can be put on contractual uh, freedoms right. as well. So there are now, having uh, exhausted that, so I'll just in around well. uh, a now, minute and a half like uh, to go through, uh, so just flag some important uh, issues when it comes to freedom of speech. The issue of intermediary liability Right. In India, we are facing a big problem with, with the really bad uh, intermediary liability law that, was, uh, that came into force uh, last year. Uh, we found uh, by sending frivolous, fake, false complaints to seven different intermediaries that six out of those actually removed it just because of the fear of the law, uh, and, and that's not a good thing. And we have to see how the Ruggie principles can actually apply. Uh, on the issue of surveillance, which I think is very important and, and interesting. Uh, the role of the private sector has actually changed. Uh, the power of the governments have actually changed through the years. Uh, when it came to the world of telegraph, it was different. What the governments could do, they could just take over a particular you know, telegraph uh, station in essence. Right? On the internet, it's more complicated. It's difficult. Uh, it's different, importantly. So now uh, we often see that governments have to work with ISPs, but that raises the question, which I don't think we have clear answers to, in terms of what role should the private sector have uh, when, when faced with issues of, of uh, surveillance? Should governments have to go through private sector uh, players when it comes to these kinds of things? I don't think we have clear answers uh, to these questions. There's the issue of costs. Uh, if the go like one good enough response you often is that it imposes too much costs on the private sector to build in surveillance. But what if the government says we'll we'll share the costs? Uh, in the past, we've had uh, Airtel, an Indian ISP, uh, publicly in its report stating that we received 400 plus letters of commendation from law enforcement agencies around India but they did not reveal in that same report how many times they'd been asked to conduct surveillance in that past year. And so these are very important questions. There's the issue of telecom licensing, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just end here. I don't want to overextend my time too much, but uh, I think uh, for some of these issues, there just aren't easy answers. I think it's worth noting that with the UK's draft uh, communications data bill, the state will be picking up the tab and has said it will pick up the tab for an increase in state surveillance. That's a very real uh, issue. Um, finally, we have Andrew. Um, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, can everybody hear me through the headphones? Just waving. Thanks. Um, a lot's been said, so I won't re I'll try not to cover the same ground. Um, I mean, my first reflection is that the privatization of censorship online is actually a function, in some ways, of the ecosystem of the Internet itself, which is one of the problems we have in dealing with it. Because the Internet is essentially a dynamic ecosystem, evolving continually, without central control, central regulation, and central planning. And that's one of its real strengths. And the governance of the internet is essentially functional. The people who run ICANN, the root servers, the engineering protocols, are like the engineers who keep your car on the road. They don't care where you drive it, how fast you drive it, and where you go. They're just concerned with keeping the network up and running. And now, whereas in the offline world, there are clear procedures if you want to adjudicate human rights. So in the offline world, if a, if a newspaper publishes an article which is alleged to be defamatory or inciting hatred or violence, there is, in a decent legal system, recourse to the courts who make that final decision as to whether the, any restriction on speech is allowed. Offline, there is no policy governments. There is no jurisdiction. Online, there, is that, there isn't that jurisdiction. And to be honest, as a human rights activist, I don't want there to be transnational jurisdiction over the internet and regulation to make those kinds of judgments because I'm very fearful about wh where we'd end up in terms of censorship and control. So it seems to me there's a bit of a dilemma. It's, as an offline activist, I can campaign in any country knowing what the legal system is and the redress is to challenge an act of censorship. Online, I'm dealing, as Pranesh said, not with a series of public spaces in the offline sense of the world, 
but a series of private spaces run by a whole network of intermediaries, many of whom may be vulnerable to pressure. Now that decentralized nature of the internet, I think is both a strength, because the large number of intermediaries, the web hosting services, the internet service providers, the domain name servers, etc., that very vast and dispersed nature means that there's a strong network and you can route around lots of problems, but it also creates vulnerable choke points. Very small companies in countries which, to be honest, as soon as somebody from the Ministry of Information Communications picks up the phone, they're not going to mess with that. This is their business, their livelihood, that's all they've got to do. If they're asked to remove content, they'll remove their content. They're not going to look at human rights standards or principles before they do that. So we have I think quite a significant challenge because the second aspect of this is that we actually don't know what the censorship is off online. I, I have no idea what it is I can't read. I have no idea what it is I can't access. If an internet service provider chooses not to resolve my request for access to a particular domain name, I don't know that. I just may get a message back saying site available, not down, or I'm hung in a queue forever. And if I'm in China or Iran, I may guess what the situation is. But if I'm in the United States or the UK or Germany, I don't really know what the situation is and why I can't resolve that domain name address. So as an advocate, it's very difficult for me to campaign on these issues because I simply don't have the information about the nature of that censorship and surveillance that's happening throughout the world. And it's particularly worrying for me that online, I think companies, and I don't blame them for this, but if they look to their business model, they will tend to play safe. A company will not go out on a limb to defy a request for censorship, except under extreme circumstances. And certainly when it may not have the backing of its host government, it may be uncertain of the political environment, it may be vulnerable to a tax raid or any of the other tricks that governments get up to in dealing with the corporate world. So if the corporation is in a conversation with a censor, the balance of power, it seems to me, is very, very uneven, and that's very worrying. And we're also seeing an increasing trend among, in terms of censorship in outsourcing the censorship and the attacks on independent human rights activists to criminal networks, principally based in Russia. And I've seen this in a number of projects that I'm working with, whereby an African government that doesn't have the technical capacity to bring down an anti-corruption website itself outsources that to a Russian mafia gang. Interesting how they were able to reach that Russian mafia gang. We can all speculate on that. And there's a massive uh, DDoS attack on that organization's website, and the web hoster throws the organization off. Because they can't, because in one case, in, in a case I'll say it in Burma, under the military regime, a very small anti-corruption site was thrown off its web provider because the attack was so large, hundreds of thousands of websites were brought down. The whole domain crashed because of the volume of attack. So in those circumstances, what is a, what is a web server going to do? They're going to say, get off my site, I don't want to host you anymore, which is what happens with, with WikiLeaks. You know, they were, their domain name server refused to resolve requests and suddenly you couldn't access the WikiLeaks information. There wasn't a kind of judicial decision anywhere that enforced that. That simply happened. And when the Egyptian government said to six ISPs shut down the internet in Egypt, it got shut down in Egypt because those companies did not want to be in a situation where they're fighting with the people who set their regulatory and legal environment for them as companies. So, so we've, got a big, we've got a big challenge. I think we should not be you know, clever about this. This is a challenge that faces anyone who believes in an open and relatively unregulated and you know, p uh, internet where we don't want a lot of content controls. How we then deal with the fact that the internet is essentially a private, a series of private constructions with all kinds of vulnerabilities. It seems to me there are three, three things that could happen. One is that we have proper monitoring and transparency about what's actually happening. <coughs> and I'd like to hear the argument why companies should not, at the very least, say that they have taken down material for this factual reason, or they've been asked to take this down, or this is what they've taken down in response to what request. 
So at least as advocates, I wouldn't be asking them to do any more than that, but at least that would give me information about what was going on. And then I could identify the kind of pressure points I wanted to exert if I was dealing with the person requesting that. The third is to get companies to be robust in the way they deal with re requests. And I think that does mean the Ruggy principles have been mentioned. And I think a rigorous application of the Ruggy principles by companies which embraces the requirements to build human rights impacts into audit and risk management, and particularly the risk management framework of a company, that could be very advantageous. That could at least give us a little bit of a leverage to make sure that requests that could be fairly safely ignored could be dealt with by the company. And again, the company can then look for external support if it's facing something bigger. And the final point, and the one that I'm torn about, but which many human rights people support, is actually to introduce the law, the national law, into this environment and say that any request to take down made to a company in a country requires a local court order and it cannot be acted on by a local court order. Personally, I think if we can't resolve it by campaigning and, if you like, by self-regulation by implementing RUGI, where we'll end up being is, is really pushing for the whole framework of restrictions on free expression to be enforceable in national courts rather than, and that private arrangements between intermediaries and governments or third parties would be made effectively unlawful or illegitimate. Now that's a, that's a big step and I think there's a lot of debate about that in the human rights movement online but I think that's clearly for me looming in the next few years. <coughs> Thank you. Can, can everybody hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yep, good, right. I'm going to open this up straight away so we get questions from the floor. Uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to have to be the roving mic. Uh, and I'm going to direct questions to individual panellists rather than the whole panel so that we can get more questions answered. Um, so who would like to open? I'm going to come this way. We've got a gentleman here. Uh, so my name is Robert Guerra. I'm with the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, I have a comment and I guess a question. Um, at the Citizen Lab, we've been producing a couple of reports on how uh, surveillance technologies have been used um, by, rep um, by uh, my name is Robert Guerra with the Citizen Lab. Um, the Citizen Lab has uh, long been doing research work on uh, both internet censorship, um, surveillance, and the use of um, uh, equipment um, that's being used against NGOs uh, around the world. I guess the, the, the question is um, what the panelists think in terms of, you know, when law enforcement does surveillance um, or um, it does takedowns, um, there are oversight mechanisms that the police is accountable for. And when this gets shifted to the private companies, um, the, the oversight mechanisms don't usually reach the private sector. So I'm just wondering, as we are seeing kind of a privatization of censorship, whether we would like it or not, um, could the laws around um, oversight um, also be updated so they would include the private actors um, themselves to bring them um, in a way like data protection protects the users in terms of what you know governments and companies have with their data in terms of you know could that be something to try to at least um, independently um, you know get a sense of whether companies are complying to the ruggy principles or other issues. So I'm just curious in terms of if that was a, a useful legislative tactic as well. Right, we'll, take, we'll take another question before we answer that. I think, can we direct that uh, question at Andrew um, to start with? If you open with this. Hi, um, my name is Khadija Ismailova. I'm journalist in Azerbaijan. And uh, I've been uh, listening to very concerning, uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, very concerning remarks regarding like desire to have sort of censorship of a sensitive content in internet uh, uh, with the with the example of the video uh, insulting prophet prophet Muhammad and uh, uh, well I'm myself I'm a victim of the uh, internet uh, insult, insult over internet. But 
internet is not to blame for that. It's uh, the, my bedroom was bugged by the government and they, then the video from my bedroom was filmed and put on the internet in order to silence my investigations in Azerbaijan. So uh, the first thing that friends suggested me is to ask the government to take it out of the internet, to ask Ministry of Communication to somehow the block, block website inside the country because it had like it had a uh, life threat for me in Azerbaijan. So if I would do it, that would be served as an excuse by the Ministry of Communication for years from now to block websites whenever they want. So I didn't do that. It's me, it's my life. And uh, it's, it's not somebody whom I respect, but he lived many years ago and uh, died many years ago. So, well, in, in my case, I decided that freedom of expression is more important than the life threat video that is posted online. And uh, well, I decided to use, to, uh, to go to the hosting company to tell them that the video is, uh, is not up to their rules and they uh, stopped the hosting of, the company, uh, of that video because it broke their agreement with their client. Uh, so the agreement bet between the hosting company and the client was broken by the video content. So, in, so I think it's the way things are in the world regarding internet regulation. I think that's enough. We have enough uh, content regulation. Uh, and, uh, and it's important that we know who is accountable for things. And I think the hosting companies should, be, should, dis should set the rules between themselves and their clients. YouTube has agreement with any user uh, that is using that. So I think, I think that's, that's perfectly enough in that term. And uh, it's uh, another thing that, is, uh, that comes to my mind uh, within this circulation. In Azerbaijan, the Ministry of National Security has right to come to any communication company and tell them that they can uh, they start the surveillance without, and Ministry of National Security is responsible for legalness of this surveillance. It's not the company, the, it's not the communication company. And I think that is, the, uh, that is the concerning trend. I think providers, communication providers, should be responsible on who is doing, who is, having surveillance over the over their lines and uh, they should also be accountable for providing this information to uh, to uh, the secret services uh, in case of Telia Sonero, Azerbaijan is one of the com uh, countries where they uh, they give this information to Minister of National Security yeah thank you very much Khadija um, I think, so the first question we'll have um, Andrew and Pranesh answer, and the second question, I think it'd be good to hear from uh, Wolf and Christoph. Uh, yeah. I very much agree with, with Robert's point that as you privatize uh, security functions, surveillance functions, there's a great danger that the mechanisms of oversight we do have um, disappear. It seems to me it's not the status of the organization carrying out the business that matters here, but the, the nature of the function. And I think if there are public functions, they should be subject to proper oversight and supervision, regardless who, ex who exercises those public functions. And as we see in many countries, a privatization of services traditionally provided by the state. Maintaining that distinction, I think, is the important one. And I think we should simply say, if it's something that we would define it as a public function, whoever carries it out, whether it's uh, state-employed police or privately employed companies, it should be subject to the appropriate supervision and control. Uh, I'm sorry, by the first question I thought uh, I was going to ask the first part of Khadija's uh, comments. Okay, uh, and 
Uh, Khadija, I've, I've heard of your story uh, before from Amin, and uh, I greatly respect uh, the choices that you've made in, in, in this. Uh, but I have to say that I disagree a little bit with, uh, with Andrew, uh, and, uh, and perhaps, I, I don't know to what extent, but you also on, on this, that I don't think the existing mechanisms uh, suffice. Uh, I don't think the existing private contracts uh, suffice. In, in one case, uh, they've worked, and for you, they've worked, from what I understand, with difficulty. At first, they didn't immediately remove the video, and later uh, on, uh, they might have changed their minds. But, uh, but the fact is, I think we have to uh, uh, buy, we have to hold on to two principles here. One is the principle of transparency. And, uh, and here we have to be a little bit pragmatic as well. So we have to know if upon a user complaint, if on the basis of terms of service, if something is removed, we should know. Uh, on the Google Transparency Report right now, for instance, we, wh one thing we don't know is uh, what percentage of what was removed was on the basis of uh, terms of service violation and what percentage was for other kinds of, uh, you know, legal violations or violations of the law of the land. Okay, and I think knowing this is very important, especially with companies taking on the powers of state without the limitations and responsibilities of states. Okay, so I think this transparency principle is very important. I think chillingeffects.org is playing a great role here. They're understaffed, underfunded etc etc but we can adopt national models I believe of chilling effects the one problem here of course is that of uh, pragmatism how much information can be uploaded onto these servers as to what you're removing okay but the second pro the second thing is is on court orders right now in the uh, in India, when we fa we were faced with the bad intermediary guidelines, uh, the takedown process, we actually uh, worked on on it for for uh, around uh, eight nine months, and we proposed an alternative. In the alternative, we make some slight concessions for online removal. We don't say first you have to get a court order, and only then can you remove. We say, and and I believe this that. You can allow them to remove it, but it has to be backed up within uh, and within a few weeks with a court order, because you can't establish two different levels of uh, of accountability. For if you want to ban a book, you require a court order in India, but if you want to ban something else on the internet, if you don't require a court order, you're setting up a whole new standard, and I don't think that is correct. Uh, the problem with court orders is twofold. One, with uh, you know uh, bad magistracy and bad judges who don't necessarily uh, uh, you know make constitutional decisions. Uh, the second is that of jurisdiction. Uh, so increasingly we have the capacity of companies to limit the blocking of stuff to a particular country. They do it for copyright, they also do it for other kinds of stuff. But the one interesting part comes up with, with courts having local jurisdiction, meaning sub-national jurisdiction. If something is to be blocked in one state in India or one district in India, then how do, how do ISPs or other companies go about doing so without blocking it in the rest of India where it's not been adjudicated to be illegal? Okay, so these kinds of issues also would arise but I think uh, these twin principles, you can't prohibit a company from removing stuff. You can't say if you don't want to have nudity, even artistic nudity on your website, you shall be forced to have it. We can't do that, even though we can force a government, uh, that, that principle upon a government. Okay, but we have to find some, some via media here, and I think it's going to be really difficult to negotiate principles of private property and contract and see how, how that works. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for the, uh, for, for the um, uh, question, for the remark. Um, just to clarify the, um, the what I wanted to, to express um, earlier, 
I think that the key point is that um, it's not clear, particularly in our part of the world, the uh, emerging countries, particularly in the Middle East, if a content is found offensive to a large number of people, how would they raise their concern? And if there is any process for them to ensure that this concern is addressed and the result of this concern is shown in a, tra in a transparent way. I think there needs to be a mechanism where um, if a content is found offensive that this is, is raised and take the consideration and the decision that's taking it down or not is, is communicated in a tra tra transparent way. Um, the um, drawback of not having such a mechanism and awareness of, of such a mechanism exists is what we have seen in terms of demonstrations. And I don't think demonstrations of that sort is, is beneficial to anybody, neither for the countries where they happen or for the world in general. So there should be, um, there was really a, a feeling that whatever you do, whatever voice you, you, you raise, your concern will not be heard and the, uh, the process will continue as it is. And I don't think this is really what, what the appropriate way to address uh, issues of, of that scale particularly of that scale. Um, I know that uh, the video was taken down by uh, Google in a couple of countries, but again, I don't think this is the, uh, the way to address uh, this concern. Tr I think transparency and um, the decision-making process by over-the-top operators or the hosting companies need, needs to be quite uh, openly communicated and the weight of the public opinion should be taken into consideration. I'm not talking about governments, I don't think governments should, be, should intervene, but the opinion of the public should be taken into consideration. Well, only uh, just, uh, just one more uh, remark. I think over the last couple of years we have seen a lot of public-private uh, uh, partnerships and in uh, parts of Europe it became a sort of fashion and uh, well and there might be some good cases best practices in such partnerships but I would always like please be more careful please don't start glorifying this as a new way out of the traditional dilemmas etc and please let's be sure what are the liabilities what is the responsibility from private partners towards the public providing public services or public like services the examples uh, Andrew uh, used before. I think we have to be much more clear in this respect. Uh, we have to define ru uh, roles, rules and responsibilities. And I think if there is a responsibility from the actors towards the public, then uh, I think we are on the right way. Uh, but I'm a, a little bit uh, afraid. Let's take the example of Switzerland. Switzerland was known over many years for a variety of public services. Energy, education, healthcare, media. And more and more such public services are partly privatized, etc and public services are somehow on the way to disappear, to evaporate because uh, conservative politicians always argue well why should the government or the, uh, the public sector do this but in many of the cases where the public sector is not responsible any longer the quality diminished and of course it makes sense for the metropolitan areas in Switzerland to privatize this because it's lucrative enough but what about the people in the marginalized areas of the country and we have to think about this as well and therefore uh, I'm very skeptical about uh, this typology of uh, public-private partnership things People who want to raise uh, questions, can they raise their hands? There's a few at the back. In the, in the meantime, while I come and bring the mic over to you, there's a very, we've got a very interesting point raised, which is around um, what you said was uh, uh, a, a large group of people found this offensive. Now, Google traditionally argue that they um, use the, a First Amendment standard around freedom of expression. So they will say that something that is found grossly 
offensive. Traditionally, they won't take it down from their services. I'd be interested to hear, um, Abalash, how do we how do we approach either a different cultural approach to freedom of expression, uh, and you know, is it right for U.S. service providers to hold up this very high standard of freedom of, of expression across the world when when dealing with these sorts of Thank you, Michael. Um, it's, um, there is no straightforward answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, before we start looking at how that standard can be enforced outside of the US, um, I think perhaps we should think about if that standard is enforced within the US itself. Um, when the, the legislation I talked about earlier, the first uh, Communications Decency Act in 1996, which tried to protect children from exposure to inappropriate content, one of the uh, criticisms which was advanced in the court and bought, uh, bought by the courts as well uh, was that how can you apply a uniform standard for free speech across the US? Because within the US itself there are states with differing, slightly different community standards that are more liberal states where uh, content might be acceptable but the same content might uh, offend in a more uh, conservative state elsewhere. So it was uh, rather unconstitutional to expect a publisher to comply with the, the most restrictive standard that applies within the US itself. So what was one of the reasons which was advanced uh, at the litigation, but eventually the decision was, no, if a publisher chooses to publish online, then you may as well comply with the law of uh, wherever it can be reached within the country. Now, if you take that outside the US, uh, then obviously uh, it raises uh, further uh, challenges. Uh, wh where do you set the standard for, uh, for free speech? Uh, at a European level, you can argue Article 10, which is broad enough, but not quite as broad as uh, the First Amendment right in, uh, in the US. So, which is again uh, one of the factors which was uh, considered when uh, recently when the UK government um, um, announced uh, that uh, proposed legislation to protect children from exposure to inappropriate content and how do you balance uh, free speech rights on the one hand and th the need to protect children on the other. Um, I can actually uh, think from a purely a pornography point of view, if you were to find a standard globally for that, perhaps you can look to, say, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and say that, well, Article 3 says that uh, children should be protected from exploitation, if you shall do things that are in the best interest of a child. And a child who cannot go into a sex shop, a physical sex shop, because of age restrictions, can actually access pornography on the internet without actually revealing who they are. Uh, now, would that um, contravene, uh, would that go against uh, the United Convention, sorry, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child? Yes, but uh, has the US signed the convention? Probably not. So there are, there are wider issues uh, which, which um, cannot be answered in one sentence, I'm afraid, but tricky one. Okay, well, we're going to bring in some more contributions. We'll take it uh. in three. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Helen Goodman. I'm a member of Parliament in uh, Great Britain. I'm not a member of the government. I'm a member of the Labour Party. Uh, I'm not at all clear that the situation we find ourselves in is one where there are new issues of principle or new philosophical dilemmas. I think it's more that we've got new practical problems that we need to sort out. And on the fundamental question uh, about free speech, I'm British, I think Article 10 gets the balance right. I'm not very comfortable with the American one for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And I'm certainly not comfortable with the situation the colleague from Azerbaijan finds herself in. So I think uh, rather than assuming that these are new dilemmas, I really don't think they are. And it seems to me that it is reasonable to protect vulnerable people, uh, that defamation is something which around which we've had uh, rules for at least 150 years and we need to continue to have them and speaking absolutely frankly i cannot imagine any government in their right mind not taking account of security issues i think it would really be quite irresponsible so what that takes me to is this question about public accountability and what I feel is that we need much clearer rules of the game. And we've got big legal loopholes. We've certainly got big le legal loopholes in Britain at the moment. We, we're taking through Parliament a defamation bill, as well as having a consultation on the rather more controversial <laughs> communications <laughs> bill 
Um, but as well as having proper public accountability, I, I just want to raise two other thoughts. One is, speaking personally, and I'm surprised other people don't feel this, I think that the private organizations have too much power and too much secrecy, and they're not accountable to anybody. I feel this quite strongly about Google, and I also feel it quite strongly about ICANN, who can't uh, vouch for the domain, the, the, the real life uh, reality of, of the website domains. I think, I think these things are problematic, and I think that as well as looking to public accountability for various functions, we do need to start thinking about international rules of the game. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to direct that question when, when it's answered uh, at uh, Camino and Andrew. Hello, I'm Chinmayi. I've, I'm a fellow at the Center for Internet and Society, and I'm an assistant professor at National Law University, Delhi. I must thank Helen for, um, for raising the questions that she did, because mine are actually very closely related. Uh, I accept so I'm, I'm beginning on the premise that a private entity that performs a public function needs to, uh, needs to come under enhanced transparency and accountability rules. I think that that goes almost without saying. But um, I'd, I'd like to take what Helen was saying further as far as the international values are concerned. Uh, I just come, I mean, to put this in context, just four days back I attended the cybersecurity summit run by the East West Clinic in India, and uh, there were many members from both uh, private companies as well as the government attending that summit. And the entire conversation was about the very legitimate uh, cybersecurity issues, cybercrime, how do we tackle it around the world. And the part of this conversation that I found really disturbing was that as we're having this conversation about how to create an architecture and a legal system that permits us to, uh, to take care of cybercrime and to cooperate and to provide information and surveil, everybody sort of hands off on the values of privacy as they vary across the world. And I think that that's, that's also going to become an Im important question now. I don't think that in a globalized world, or even in a world in which we claim to, to respect human rights, it's okay for everyone to say that, yeah, well, you just do this according to your country's regulations. It's very different when we're talking about um, cultural standards of what, what is offensive in one country may not be as offensive in another country versus when we're talking about countries um, that have widely varying principles on whether you can violate privacy at all or not, or whether there are mechanisms, specific mechanisms, like the EU protects privacy in very detailed and uh, specific fashions. My country, in principle, has a right to privacy, but no specific mechanisms are required, which means that implementation becomes very difficult. And I think that in this context, when these conversations are happening, and when these mechanisms are being set up, it's time to come up with a bare global minimum standard. And I and to have this conversation about how responsible it is for various countries that have great human rights regimes and democratic processes within their countries to refuse to mandate that these processes are embedded and embedded in a way in which they cannot be violated when um, cybercrime conventions or, um, or, cyber or surveillance technology is being sold across the world. And I think that how, how to achieve that, what kind of, um, how we would pick up values from both um, international instruments as, as well as sort of general principles of human rights and how we would sort of translate them such that they would be acceptable around the world is, um, is a question that, that many of you will answer for your perspective. Um, I'm going to direct that at Hussein. I'd also like to add to that. Um, has the specific experience of the revolution altered Egyptians' view of privacy? I'm going to take one more question on this side. If there's anyone else who wants to answer a question on this side. No, okay. Hussein, do you want to start? Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for addressing yet another question. <laughs> but that's, um, uh, certainly, the Egyptian revolution has, uh, has brought, again, to the front the issue of, uh, of, of social media and the use of social media for people to, uh, to um, um, start campaigns, share their opinions, and rally support across, across the population. Um, and that wasn't really tapped or, or um, uh, seen before by, by, by the government. Um, after the revolution, the, the interest in social media has, has continued and is continuing. 
and we see people getting online or getting um, accounts on, uh, on, the, on the internet, on the DSL or any other mechanism, just for the mere reason to be connected on to social media. Um, of course, privacy is, um, is, is, uh, is, is a concern and um, concerns with privacy have also raised after the revolution because a mere number of people communicating, not only a number, but also the uh, demographic graphics of people. Some of them are illiterate, but they know how which keyboards they, 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 they can punch to get to get online and, uh, and see the pictures or enter opinion. Um, now, we don't have yet a, a framework, a legal framework to, um, to set privacy, privacy issues um, um, straight. And that's one of the um, um, four laws that relate to telecommunications and uh, um, IPRs that are being are being brought uh, in front of the new parliament when when it gets into into the um, into, into session hopefully by uh, beginning of next year. So uh, to answer your question, yes, privacy issues are now um, a, a big concern, and we know that the existing framework does not touch on privacy issues, particularly that relate to, to online. Um, um, we have seen a draft of, of this issue uh, of this um, some some aspects of this law we get provide the opinion to. Um, but we see another another important um, issue regarding privacy, not only for national institutions, private sector or operators that can share users' information, but more so from over-the-top operators who have access perhaps to more information than, than national operators. And they have the freedom to share this information whoever they see fit for marketing purposes or for money generating purposes or other purposes. And we see this uh, a loophole in most laws across, um, across the Middle East uh, where it has been um, uh, adopted such privacy laws. This is a concern that um, we as internet um, society in Egypt try to, to raise to, to, to bring to the front make sure that when we drafting such um, actions, such laws, that they address both national national operators or national players as well as international players as much as possible, of course. I'm going to just bring quickly in Pranesh on this point on uh, privacy. Thanks, Mike. I'd just like to point out that um, global minimum standards uh, with re in regard to pr privacy uh, are never going to emerge, not from governments, definitely. Uh, and uh, insofar as they can emerge from other parts uh, when it comes to uh, privacy standards re uh, regarding corporations and things like the right to be forgotten. Uh, they're way too contentious, there's no agreement, so even in, uh, with regard to corporations, they can't arise even outside of an intergovernmental space, uh, even within civil society. So I think, but what we can work towards uh, is uh, ways to address violations or what are perceived as violations and ways to get governments into those platforms. So I think that kind of a uh, multi-stakeholder perhaps or even intergovernmental mechanism is something that can be worked towards. But in terms of just standards, I, I, I don't think it's ever going to happen. To reply the lady from the UK, um, First, in my intervention, the first thing I mentioned is that public institutions will can ultimately ultimately be held responsible for for the inaction, and we take due account of the fact that the internet is 90%. Uh, well, I don't know exactly the percentage, but highly managed and controlled by private sector. And I hear some of your concerns. Uh, I can tell you that we implement self-regulation where we cannot regulate, and we regulate where we can. And one of the evidences is Article 13i, uh, 13a of the new telecom framework that actually forces sec uh, security companies to disclose security breaches, which can actually have a strong impact in the privacy of citizens. Uh, in terms of security... In terms of security and the threats to privacy, I would also like to remind you that security is a competence of member states and we have a limited uh, leeway there. And thirdly, uh, addressing ICANN, you can resort if you want to our website where we have four fishes addressing the corporate responsibility of ICANN to try to ensure that it has the maximum level of accountability, transparency and also accountancy. I don't know if that replies to your broad question. Yeah, just to, to, to pick up on Helen's points, um, it's great to see a, a legislator here, actually. We don't see enough legislators in these forums. Too often it's just government, business, and, uh, and civil society. I mean, firstly, I agree with you. I don't think the issues around censorship, the principles, the values, are fundamentally different online or offline. 
I don't think human rights are fundamentally different online or offline. It's a, a set of practical problems that are presented to us. So I think you're right there. And I think the key to it is, as you said, accountability and ensuring that the mechanisms we have to deal with legitimate concerns are genuinely accountable. And I, I think a number of us are worried, not recognizing the need for child protection, whether the, all the mechanisms that exist to a, enable child protection in the online world are genuinely accountable, whether some of them don't capture a whole number of, say, lesbian and gay networks and organizations, as well as organizations that are sexually exploiting children. I think there's a number of concerns about the effectiveness of that system as it operates globally. And I think a number of us will be very concerned at the sense that you need a global set of rules to govern the internet. I'm not quite sure if that's what you meant, but I would be very concerned in terms of free expression, whose rules would predominate in, in an international arena. I happen to prefer the US approach to defamation to the British approach to defamation, as do many wealthy people who litigate to defend their reputations from legitimate criticism, because our defamation laws are wholly biased towards the wealthy and powerful and against the public interest. I I'm less keen on the US tolerance of hate speech, but that's part of their cultural fabric, and I don't think it's for the international community to impose upon the US their, you know, our standards on hate speech on their particular jurisdiction. So I think we have to recognize there are different value systems in the world. And part of the joy of the internet is you can choose by what you select and how you act, the kind of value systems you prefer. And I'm really not convinced that a global regulation would solve the problems of censorship in the way that you suggest, in the way that, I don't know if you were suggesting, but I thought I got a hint of that. And lastly on the companies, I think the companies are, a growing number of companies are too powerful, they are too dominant. And I think the solution is effective enforcement of anti-monopoly and competition law to allow new entrants into the market to, to break up those monopolies. And I think where protections come into force, governments have a responsibility that in the internet they've largely chosen not to exercise to make sure that certain standards are protected. So I think in terms of your discussion, the interesting battle for me in the next two years will be in Europe over privacy protection because there's a European privacy a directive designed to upgrade data protection law to bring it into, co into line with the, the impact of the internet. Google has said it's the end of the internet. What they actually mean is it's the end of Google's business model, which is not yet quite the same thing as the end of the internet. But let me, let me just challenge you know, anyone, any legislator, can you guarantee that that directive will pass through 27 national legislatures in Europe uh, and go through and become an enforceable European directive, or will the companies win that battle in a battle with democratically elected governments? If I was a betting person, I'd put my money on the companies winning that battle, unfortunately, rather than the governments of Europe uh, supporting that directive. But we'll see. But that's partly your job as a legislator to go back and make sure those protections exist and make sure that effective competition law, and I think that's the way of dealing with large monopoly companies, is if necessary, break them up as we broke up monopolies in the past and ensure proper competition. I feel that the, um, the lack of microphones and the fact that we haven't been able to have a simultaneous conversation is almost like a parable for, the, uh, for how technology impacts on freedom of expression. Um, I think what we'll do now is we'll have a, uh, a quick one minute um, summing up uh, from the panelists. I'd like them to slightly address who the question of who polices the big corporations, or is it good, who polices the large corporations, or is it good, uh, or is it good in a sense, as we've seen from the audience, that nobody at present seems to be capable of doing so? So if we start with uh, Pranesh. Uh, you got me uh, thinking on my feet. Um, yes, yes. Well, I think, everybody has to police uh, the large corporations. Uh, I uh, agree quite a bit with what, what Andrew said right at the end, uh, that other than those kinds of direct mechanisms that exist, currently, uh, and I again emphasize that the two big issues for me are how do we deal with their rights to private property, how do we deal with their freedom of contract, without having answers for those, and these to the limited extent that I disagree uh, with uh, the MP, uh, I would say that these two are new issues that we are facing now in a, because of the scale at which we are facing now. They've existed earlier, and we've 
they've been dealt with, but the scale is is just gone off the charts now. And until we can come to some kind of consensus, we should we can only through dialogue in spaces like the IGF, I believe, uh, and and through dialogue through between multiple stakeholders, until we come to some kind of consensus on those two very important issues, we can't come to the issue of policing corporations because that's at the heart of how do we police corporations and to what extent should they be allowed to keep their freedoms. Thanks. Well, I would argue in the, in the same direction that uh, the old, the traditional regulation models are perdu, uh, th they don't uh, exist, they cannot be uh, adapted to the digital uh, uh, age any longer. Therefore, I think there are key factors are empowerment of users. This is one of my key points, empowerment of the users. Know about your rights, what you can do. The more users are empowered, the better they can control uh, private actors, etc. And I think it must be this common bottom-up responsibility don't trust in, uh, uh, in, 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 in governments uh, where you don't have to. And uh, check and balance. So these are the traditional uh, principles what made democracy strong. And I think we have to redefine uh, these uh, principles again and uh, the coalition on rights and uh, internet rights and principles has made a very uh, important effort in the right direction and I think this is the line we have to uh, continue our work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, who polices the large corporations? A lot of ISPs are these days very large uh, corporations and uh, clearly there should be accountability for what they do. Uh, for, for instance, if they get a complaint about an illegal uh, content, a website hosting illegal content, whether they actually investigate the merits of the complaint or do they just take it off to avoid liability uh, is, is a question. We heard two different models here, one as a question and also as a comment here from the panel. Uh, one was to require um, ISPs to obtain a court order first before you take down content, which is uh, good in an ideal world, but because the time it may take, uh, it may be too late for a lot of uh, content or later a lot of complaints. The second model which was uh, heard was a court order later, which is the case in India, I suppose. It's a proposal, it's a proposal in India at the time. Um, now, they it's fine, it's better than the other one, but the, the problem is it will obviously have a lot of cost implications for ISPs if to, to obtain a court order every time content has been uh, removed, so taking the wider world global scene that is. So can we find a middle ground between the two? Um, the UK has a model to offer, the Internet Watch Foundation, uh, which acts as an independent uh, body. There are criticisms of IWF, but nonetheless, uh, they've done excellent work in reducing the number of uh, child pornographic websites hosted in the UK. And uh, they do investigate complaints, and they, they look into the merits of the complaint, and then they ask uh, an ISP to take down uh, that, that content, uh, which is, you know, a bit like a quasi-judicial uh, body, if you like, uh, still works. But there are criticisms that they're not really transparent in the, in the way they work. There is no appeals uh, process beyond that. But I would think something like that would work a lot better than uh, requiring corporations to obtain a court order or, or uh, either before or after taking down uh, content. I think the answer to big companies is effective regulation, business regulation and competition law but it's a very big challenge. A Apple are now the largest company in the world with a market cap of around $600 billion. And they have a war chest, a cash float of at least 50 billion, which means they can spend a lot, of, they can do a lot of litigating to crush their opponents in a lot of courts if they choose to. Uh, at a recent case involving an attempted telecoms merger in the US, the Justice Department that deals with competition had about 30 lawyers working on the case. The telecoms companies put 600 lawyers in the field to work on that merger case. They bought up every lawyer in Washington who was unattached to a law firm. You just couldn't buy a lawyer. There was no lawyers available because they were all working on, on the merger. Now, the justice happened to win that case, which is great news, 
but it shows you the unequal scale of the competition. And I think the other thing that governments could do is ensure that the large communications companies that are making a lot of money pay the tax on, them, on their earnings in the, in the jurisdictions where they earn the money and not where they're legally registered. Because these companies are massive tax avoiders who are robbing the public exchequer and then handing out a little bit of grants, a little bit of favours, sponsoring Google Big Tent, which I declare interest. I'm going to it tonight because it's, be, it's going to be a great event. But I expect them to pay their taxes like any other business in the country. And that, but legislators have got to do this. You've got to sit down with your fellow legislators and governments and decide you're actually going to create that framework to ensure these companies not don't operate and don't, don't make money, but pay a fair tax and don't allow, are not allowed to monopolize the market. I think that uh, regulation is not always the solution and that we have to look for long-term solutions uh, that bring about a change for corporate cultures. Uh, my impression, my personal impression I take off the hat of the European Commission is that with uh, most of the times with uh, legal solutions we're running the risk of entering a cat and mouse game, which is what I've seen, and also competition law is sometimes not really the best place to, to um, address uh, problems related, for instance, with intellectual property rights or criminal law. So, um, and um, I would also like to say that it would be easier for us to, uh, in order to address the, the magnitude of the problem, to have also real statistics coming from law enforcement agencies. Because so far, through reports like the Google report on transparency, we know on the side of the private company what ma how many requests of access to, uh, to information have received, but we, we never have access to law enforcement data. And that would actually help us very much balance our actions. Um, yes, um, to the first part of the question, yeah, I, uh, it's obvious that there's nobody policing large corporations. Basically, they have uh, the authority to make decisions and um, influence and uh, go forward with decisions without giving any uh, justification uh, or, or transparency to how decisions were, were made. Um, I, 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 um, I like the argument that um, the public has, has a role to play and um, uh, the public has a decision to make, uh, to participate in these services or to abstain from participating in these services. And we have seen um, uh, regarding mobile operators, for example, when um, prices were, were hiked, two of them agreed to hiking the prices, basically the public decided two days without mobi mobile service. And you can imagine the loss of revenue for these. And recently, what after the, the movie issue, um, the a group of people also decided to abstain from using uh, YouTube and Facebook for, for a, week, a week's time. So I, I think the public has, has a role to play and um, maybe this we should start from, from bottom bottom up approach. Mobilize the public and then government intervention through um, um, right policy making and, um, and um, uh, um, regulation will certainly uh, emphasize, uh, emphasize the solution. Well, uh, our policy pamphlet is available at indexoncensorship.org and we'll be live tweeting the IGF. I think we should thank the uh, panellists in the customary way with a short round of applause. Thank you.